any rate, welcome everybody tonight. I'm uh, Frank County Mayor of the City of Des Moines, and uh, we're here tonight for Talk of the City. Uh, we, every year, uh, especially since Scott's been here, we keep expanding the opportunities. We want to continue to get citizen feedback on what we're doing, how we're doing it, where we're going, what our plans are, how we're spending the money, and uh, we feel it's a dynamic process. It's one that we continually want to get citizen input, uh, and hopefully we can get more and more as time goes along, and we try to uh, do it at different places around the city, not just at City Hall. So we uh, thank all of you for showing up tonight at uh, the Central Library, and uh, we're going to go through some of our, our efforts. Uh, at any rate, um, part of it is going to be to talk about your property tax and where that money goes and how we spend it and what we're doing. We're also going to uh, talk uh, in our, uh, Bob Fagan is going to work on that, and uh, so we'll bring him up here in a second. We're then going to talk about our streets and street repair, as you all know. Uh, that's part of, uh, of Move DSM. It's about what we're spending, how we're spending it, and uh, I think you'll see that over the next 10 years, we're going to spend $300 million uh, to do that. Um, um, I want to uh, mention uh, Connie Bose and Josh Mandelbaum, uh, our two city council members that are, that are here sitting in the audience, and our newly elected uh, um, uh, councilor, Carl Voss. Carl, where are you? There he is, right back there. So uh, thank you all for attending and, and being here this evening. Uh, I will uh, also uh, say that we're going to uh, move along, and, and Scott's going to, uh, our city manager, uh, will go over uh, some of the other details of what we're doing and how we're doing it. But again, this is a process. We want citizen input. That's who we serve every single day. And it's, it's the city, it's our citizens, it's our neighborhoods working together with our businesses to make a great place to work a great place to live, a great place to raise a family. And we have plans and we've been working on them for years with your input. And uh, we want to continually uh, get your input and uh, let us know how you feel about where we're going. And with that, uh, I, I had about an hour and a half speech I was going to make and they wanted me to cut it down a little bit. So I'm going to turn it over to Bob Fagan. Bob, uh, come on up. I want you all to know that at the end of this month, Bob is going to be leaving us. So he's been a great finance director and uh, has uh, really given us uh, a great support in the finance department. I know that uh, Scott has appreciated his input as well. So, Bob, thank you for your uh, your work and your effort in keeping us financially uh, sound. Appreciate it. Wow, I'm not used to applause. So thank you, Mayor, for giving me your other hour. I'll, I'll take that piece. So anyway, good evening, and thanks for coming tonight. I'm Bob Fagan, the Finance Director for the City of Des Moines. And uh, what my portion will be is go through a couple of videos here that kind of explain what goes on with the property tax and how that gets developed, as well as how we get into transparency. So, um, so the first one we're going to do is a presentation on understanding your property taxes. So. Uh, I get it. I get it. You're no different than what it was in my house. That we talked. I kept coming home telling my wife, "Hey, we're dropping tax rates 60 cents. It's going to be great." And we open it up. She goes, "Well, what happened? We're paying more than we were before." So, so I just want to say that is because we're all the same because we all live in Des Moines anyway, and we're under those same things. And what I hope that you can see in this first video, and even though the city dropped its tax rate, you'll see a little bit of the way things work. That it doesn't always mean that your actual amount of taxes that you're going to pay will work from that point. So. As a Des Moines homeowner, you recently received your property tax statement and likely noticed a slight increase. This generated questions to city council members and staff, so we wanted to provide a clear understanding of this change. If you think about your annual property tax bill as a pie graph, you'll see it's made up of many slices or tax rates. Des Moines Public Schools, City of Des Moines, Polk County, Broadlawns Medical Center, and others. Now, thanks to the local option sales tax approved last spring by Des Moines voters, the city of Des Moines, as promised, reduced its rate by 3.5%. All the other rates pretty much remain flat. Because the city of Des Moines makes up roughly just one-third of this equation, your combined tax rate from year to year 
came down only slightly. So you're probably asking, if the rate came down, why did my recent tax bill still go up? It's because of a hike in your home's taxable value resulting from rollback, a percentage adjusted each year depending on Iowa's economy. Rollback is intended to level out the economic highs and lows. From 2019 to 2020, a higher rollback was applied to your assessed property value, resulting in a slightly higher taxable value, the amount you actually pay tax on. So here's how that breaks down. For a property assessed at $100,000, that meant a hike in your 2020 taxable value of roughly $1,300. And that increase in your overall taxable value, driven by a hike in the rollback percentage, is what is behind the increase you see in your annual tax bill. Hopefully that gives you a general understanding of how that took place. And so I don't forget, I'll be, I'll be sticking around after this presentation and later, and so if you have questions about that or the other things I go over, I'd be happy to do that. So the second video that we're gonna do is gonna talk about transparency and the city of Des Moines prides itself on its transparency, so the slides you're going to see, or the video you're going to see has to do with that. Part of it is, how does our budget process work? How does it, when does it start? When does it end? To kind of give you an idea when you might want to get involved in that piece. Currently, we're, um, we're a little ways into it at this particular time, but the council actually doesn't approve it until sometime at the end of March, so there's plenty of time to, to learn more and be active in it. And the other part is, and the transparency part is, you're going to see what about our audits and and actually, the city's been very fortunate the last 42 or 43 years, we've won an award for our audit. And it's just part of the transparency that it is. And, and we're also going to, you're going to see on this video that the website, you can get on Des Moines and how you can access any financial data that you want to get. So with that, if we can do the next uh, video. Here's a brief overview of the city of Des Moines annual budget process. The city council based their strategic priorities on plan DSM and guide DSM and communicates with the city manager. The city manager instructs the department directors whether any changes in city services can be factored into the next budget process. Starting in late July, the finance department updates its projections based on each department's expenditure history, individual project costs, inflation factors, revenues, and salaries. November through January, the city council holds workshop meetings to discuss a variety of different budget topics for the upcoming fiscal year. Through January, the Finance Department works with each department and the City Manager's Office to compile an operating budget and a capital improvement program budget. In February and March, the City Council holds public hearings to set a cap on property tax revenue, discuss the proposed budgets, and adopt the final budgets. The State of Iowa requires one-year budget to be adopted and submitted by March 31st of each year. The city's budgets can be found on the city's website at dsm.city. To make sure the city is being good stewards of public funds, the finance department starts working in July on a comprehensive financial report. Through November, auditors complete an independent, objective evaluation of the city's financial reports and processes for regulators, investors, directors, and managers. In December, the audit is completed and published, and for more than 40 consecutive years, the city has been awarded a Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. In January, auditors meet with City Council, discuss the results of the audit, and provide assurance that the city financial statements are accurate and complete. Review the city's comprehensive annual financial report and audit results on the city's website at dsm.city. Okay, next would be uh, Jonathan from Public Works. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jonathan Gano with the Public Works Department. Uh, I have uh, just two topics that we're going to talk about, but they are usually the most important ones in any gathering when we're talking about uh, the city and its finances. Uh, and it's, we're going to talk about the most important street in town. Um, surely you all know which one that is, right? The one in front of your house, that's the most important street in town. And a, lot, a common question we get is why are the streets so bad? So we have prepared an explainer that dives a little bit into the, the details of, of why the streets are the way they are.
is a lot of information that's available at the, the, the click of a mouse on the city's website, and I encourage you to, uh, to wander around and find stuff there. It's, it's an, a, a bewildering variety of things that are, that are at your fingertips uh, just by looking. Uh, and if that uh, does not answer questions, you can always give us a call where our number is at the side of every garbage can in town, so it's easy to remember. Uh, you don't even have to remember, you just look it up. Um, our, our next most important topic is stormwater. That uh, came uh, to the top of everybody's attention last summer uh, with a, a, a record amount of rainfall landing in a very short period of time uh, and performed what, uh, what in probably financial terms would be called a stress test on our stormwater system. And we found a lot of places where it was wanting and needed a lot of improvements. We've, we are an old city, so there is a lot of places that need a lot of work, and we've been working for a long time, and that showed us that our pace of progress was not going to be fast enough. So the city council uh, undertook an enormous effort to, to speed that up and deliver relief to neighborhoods uh, that need it in, uh, in, in a much sooner time period. Uh, so the next piece, we'll review those, uh, those circumstances and, and answer the, the, uh, the, the question of what we're, going, what we're going to do about it. There's about five cars literally up to the roof. Nothing we can do. June 30th, 2018 brought a torrential downpour and in many neighborhoods, particularly on the north side of town. It was a, a record-setting amount of rainfall in a, in a very short period of time, and it absolutely overwhelmed the ability of the storm sewer system to handle that kind of rain. Something happened in Des Moines that had never happened before. We're pretty strong, great, a resilient community, but on June 30th, uh, the climate won, and we had to figure out a way to get around it. We designed storm sewers to handle once in a lifetime kind of events, and this was once in three lifetimes. That is not something that any infrastructure is ever designed for. We ended up with over 1,800 homes uh, that reported negative impacts from the flood, whether it was minor basement flooding to just outright destruction of the structure. The, the city offered to purchase almost a, just short of 100 homes in the immediate weeks right after the event. Being able to do that with local dollars meant we could do that while the basement had not yet been repaired, the basement walls were still open and unsecured, and before any of the mechanicals had been repaired or replaced, and, and step in and offer uh, financial assistance to move those those families on to new homes elsewhere. So all around the city, there were lines of people trying to get rid of damaged property, couches, fridges, you know, carpet, uh, drywall, and it was astounding the amount of garbage and ruined materials that this flood created. Luckily, the water dissipated quickly, but it was really obvious the pattern of problems uh, that the city had. Uh, issues that we could solve that we had never seen before because we had never seen a night like that. The stormwater experience in those neighborhoods is very different now than it was when those neighborhoods were built in the 1930s, 40s, or 50s. The flood response has showed us exactly where we have problems in our storm sewer system. The ability to, to move homes out of kind of the escape path for the extremely large quantities of water uh, has been very helpful. In this aftermath of the flood experience, the city council asked the city staff to, to be able to plan to do this even faster. We need bigger sewers. We need to tear up our streets. We need to spend the money that's necessary. And uh, we used to fight over petty things. Can we use your land? Can we buy this property from you so we can put the sewer through this area? 
Uh, it's all for one and one for all now that this is a problem we're gonna solve. We're actually looking at spending uh, over 145 million over the next six years on stormwater improvements alone. Uh, just to give a comparison, the city spent 80 million in the past 10 years. Uh, so pretty much tripling the rate of projects uh, focusing on stormwater in the city. Uh, so what was already a, a historic increase in the pace of the construction of storm sewer improvements uh, by the beginning of 2018 uh, turned into, uh, in the middle of 2018, an even a faster accelerated pace of construction of, of those improvements. We're uh, continuing forward with the plan to improve what's called the closest creek watershed, uh, which uh, is pr primarily in the Beaverdale neighborhood. Uh, work recently started on Makokota Drive, uh, which in involves installing a large sewer box. Uh, we're also starting on uh, installing some large storm sewer boxes uh, in the area of 47th and Holcomb, uh, which will, one, provide conveyance, but also actually store water underground uh, to slow the release of stormwater as it makes its way through the system. A perennial question we get from property owners in and around the city is what can they do to help? And it is always hard to think about building big storm sewers. They're big, large, expensive infrastructure that's publicly owned, it's in the street, it's not on your property. But every single property in town has rainfall that lands on it. And there is always an opportunity to capture and infiltrate some of that water on one's property before it reaches the storm sewer. A great example is soil quality restoration, where you simply add extra organic matter to the, to the existing turf. It stays exactly the same, but it turns the yard into more of a sponge so it can capture and hold rainwater that lands on it and releases it back to the environment at a much slower rate so it doesn't become contributory flood water to your neighbors downstream. I realized in, uh, in hindsight that I wore the exact same pullover as I did the day that I recorded that. I promise I have more than one outfit. This is not quite a uniform. Though it has a logo, it's not a uniform. Um, we, we've done a lot of talking and we've shown uh, quite a few videos. Um, but I wanted to open the floor for any questions. We have uh, uh, Mr. Seca in the back here has a microphone, so he'll, he'll get that to you to ask any questions. If I can't answer it, we also have team members from the engineering department uh, who might have more specific uh, project level answers if there are questions for streets. Yes, sir. Tim Leadingham from Beaverdale. Uh, I think that was a great presentation. And your flyer is, is excellent. It's talking about remediation of already developed property, mm -hmm. how you can retain more uh, storm <coughs> uh, rainfall, excuse me. <coughs> but, you know, you said you're going to spend $145 million. What if you spent maybe 1% or less of that on acquiring some of these properties that I know are around the city that are already providing these benefits instead of letting them, letting them be developed and add to the stormwater runoff. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, I, when I investigated this, I found that there is no budget for land acquisition, um, maybe other than for streets or something, but for this purpose or for recreation and parks, there's no budget, there's no fund to acquire property. Uh, if I can get a little too protective for public benefit. The, the land acquisition page in the budget that you're referring to is uh, to make federal transportation spending accounting uh, and project reporting back to the federal government easier. We do purchase land, we do acquire uh, properties uh, for stormwater purposes, for street purposes, for parks purposes. Um, those budgets are built into the projects at the project level rather than a set aside just for land acquisition. An example of that is the almost 100 homes that were purchased uh, in the immediate aftermath of last summer's uh, last summer's deluge, uh, that was uh, the ability to step in with local dollars, which was different from 20 years worth of flood buyouts in the Four Mile Creek area, um, where we could step in with, with completely local dollars, no federal strings attached, and two years ahead of uh, when we might have expected to do that. Um, 
and that lets us purchase properties that are distressed. Uh, in, in the immediate aftermath of that event, uh, those are homes where the walls are still knocked down, the mechanicals are still, uh, still soaking wet and haven't been replaced yet. Um, and before any building permits have been pulled to do any repairs, uh, and, and that lets us step in and, and acquire those properties. Um, elsewhere, inside neighborhoods where we had uh, uh, what, what, what would be, have been overland flow from an overwhelmed storm sewer coursing through, uh, through built up neighborhoods, um, that showed us where the weak points are in uh, the neighborhood's ability to handle that much water. Um, a, a, I want to say about a third of the homes acquired in uh, the summer of 2018 were uh, exactly that. They were homes inside neighborhoods where away from the floodplain and away from where you might expect it. Uh, so, so to answer your question, yes, we do acquire properties and where we have a stormwater interest or any of the other city interests, we, we will and can and do and have uh, acquired land uh, to, to either get it out of the way of water or to keep, uh, keep problems from happening uh, elsewhere in that neighborhood. Yes, sir. Sure. Great, great question, Scott Sanders, city manager. Uh, I would, uh, I want to offer up that we do also have other programs in place to acquire additional uh, park lands. Um, it, it is limited, but we, we've had, for instance, um, uh, about 70 acres added along Hartford down by the soccer fields. Um, and there are other examples where we've actually been able to add uh, to, to forested areas that will not get developed. Um, so there, there are other examples of that as well. Um, the mayor reminds me that years ago uh, with prior floods, you know, moratoriums on building in new uh, floodplain areas, designated areas, uh, was restricted even years ago. And so again, also on some of Jonathan's uh, uh, comments, uh, we're in a better place now uh, than we were years ago in uh, acquiring those properties that are subject to flooding and, and getting them moved and again returned to a, a more natural state. So there are several different plans and partnerships too. Uh, Polk County Conservation has been a great partner in some of those projects as well. So. Jenny Kleist, 2505 47th Street in Des Moines. Um, with an additional 13 inches of rain in October, the National Weather Service is already predicting flooding in the spring. How will the city proactively address this flooding? Um, have, how have the communication and emergency notification gaps between the city and the county been closed? And what is the plan to utilize social media and news media, weather radios, et cetera, to communicate flood potential before an event? Um, I can answer some of those questions on the spot. Others will take uh, a little more research. Um, I can tell you from the communications um, and particularly the, the last question, the social media and the communications outreach um, and, and emergency notifications, we have uh, quadrupled the communication staff. They're the ones running the show here behind the scenes uh, at the city. So uh, we, we, an enormous uptake in the professional uh, ca capacity of the city to be able to reach out and communicate to its, uh, to its residents. Um, the, uh, the other questions, I think I'll need to check uh, the, the specifics in order to get you a better, uh, better and, and satisfactory answer. You know, usually, um, especially with uh, Jenny, on, on a situation like you're talking about where you're already predicting a building up in the watershed and everything else and what's going to happen and the spring will come and snow melt and everything else, that usually is the pattern that we try to uh, uh, mitigate and, and uh, keep everybody informed, and that's a little easier. So those of you that remember 2008 and 2010, we spent a lot of time, uh, and I remember uh, the late Bill Stowe and I, uh, spent lots of time with the media two times a day letting everybody kind of know how it was progressing. The June 30 event of last year was a totally new experience where, you know, as it was put up here, uh, we were thinking two inches of rain and, you know, it was going to, yeah, be heavy, but, you know, maybe we can handle it. 
but when you get five to ten inches of rain in two and a half to three and a half hours, it changes everything. And so now the social media aspect, we've tried to look at that and how do we build that up. The 211 piece, how do we do that? And of course, in that case, I remember I was talking to some of our, uh, our rescue guys that were out uh, pulling people out of houses. Uh, in one case, an older couple, they went to the door, you know, and knocked, and here they are at midnight or 12.30, and light finally comes on. They said, what are you doing here? And they said, you need to evacuate your house. And they said, well, we, okay, what's going on? Well, there's a flood. And they said, well, we'll get in our car. They said, no, your car's underwater. We're here in a boat to pick you up. And so it's a, it, you know, it's a totally different experience, and we have to prepare for that as well. So uh, we're working, and, and I know that uh, Chief Kip uh, is working with um, uh, Polk County, and we're trying to figure out how we all work together as a region to let all of our citizens know. So good point, uh, lots of different circumstances. Uh, with a building deal, we'll do what we have done in the past and let everybody know how, you know, code yellow, code orange, now red, we're going to do this, that. Let everybody know, sandbags here, there. But if we get another one of those June 30 events, we got to look at it differently. Chief, did you want to say something? John Tkip, Chief of the Fire Department. It's a great question, and I'm not going to get into the weeds on the mechanics of all of the pieces, but after the, the flash floods of 2018, um, city staff asked itself to take a look at all of our processes. So did all of our partners through Polk County Emergency Management, and the citizens clearly said, hey, um, there's better ways to communicate. How can you, kind of your question has, has existed over time. The city staff at the manager's direction did an after action of our response, and all of the Polk County Emergency Management, um, which is all of the commu uh, communities in Polk County, also did an after action, and we reconciled those. And a couple pieces that came out of that are, um, uh, one, the National Weather Service has some new tools for um, speeding up its ability to make announcements, and unfortunately the 50 car pileup on I-80 was the first time they've used it. And so we're able to get the word out um, almost in, in real time. That li literally happened um, immediately. There wasn't a three hour uh, run up to that. And so we know that that tool works. Uh, internally, um, without getting too much in the weeds, there's a process for the county level of flash reports and incident reports. Lots of capabilities and we all help feed that. We're, we're replicating that at the city level so it's seamless between city and county. And I think that will, that will help us. It certainly will help the operational departments be able to inform everyone else and we'll be able to see some of their work as well. Um, but the, the, the last piece, which I think will, will also be beneficial was, uh, and the mayor um, was, a, was a part of the conversation, the long-term recovery, not just our response into the water in this example, um, but for any type of emergency, how do we immediately ra uh, ramp up capacity for social services, for getting information to people. Um, that, that effort is just uh, uh, wrapping up in a, in a fundraising capability so that uh, while Jonathan described using city dollars to take care of homes, there's a lots of, there, there are a lot of nonprofits uh, in regionally and across Iowa that want to be able to help out. Something bad happens, we pick up the phone, we engage a, a, a machinery that will help that part. So, I'm very confident that we're working on the right things and we're still within a couple months of, um, of finishing some of those things off. But we are looking at immediate notification, how we operate with, as a city and how we operate as a, as a community, how we recover. And so um, the, the first couple pieces I think uh, were, were put out in the after action reports at the county, but we'll continue to let the, uh, the, the community know as we hit different uh, milestones and we have different tools but we're working on that, and we worked on it last week, this week, and I know I have one next week. Yes? I knew you were going to ask that, and I can't answer it in detail. Uh, last night I talked with A.J. Mum, the Polk County Emergency Management uh, Director, and um, uh, he gave about... 30 of the chiefs an, an update on it. He was so excited, and of course, I don't remember the actual name of the tool, um, but it was broadcast at least out to the emergency management and, and went out to the operational end. I don't think it, I think it went out in a, in a press release, 
but, and so one of the things that we'll look at is how do we translate to get it to citizens, hopefully on their phone, so it's just easy to see. So. Other questions on streets and stormwater? Yeah, my name is Nathaniel Gavronsky, and uh, this is more of a, of a long term because in the video it talked about how these neighborhoods aren't what they used to be. I mean, there, there's a lot of you know population increasing and a lot of development in these areas, and that restricts water in certain areas and causes some of this problem. And we discussed how you were going to try to bring it back to natural state. Uh, in Europe, one of the things that they were doing is they were actually dredging and making it more of a hard line for the water to go through so they could actually control the flow and actually feed it into the larger river systems and make it f drain out much, much faster and efficiently without restricting the development of new uh, p properties. Has the city looked into doing any of those types of projects? Uh, we take a holistic approach to solving the the stormwater problems in a neighborhood at, at the on, thinking on a watershed scale rather than just block to block uh, or development by development uh, so yes we do prefer natural drainage systems because they're uh, usually better at moving the water uh, faster and cheaper and safer more safely to the to its final destination away from uh, somewhere where it might cause problems Yeah, we, we, as I said, this, we take a big picture look at, um, at solving the stormwater problems, and our engineering department has a, um, what we call a green infrastructure first approach to solving it, rather than putting it into a gray pipe or, or black top. Uh, their first preference is to look at green solutions uh, to try to move the water or detain the water or retain it or absorb it or infiltrate it uh, before it can even collect up and cause uh, cause of flooding problem in someone in someone's home. Gloria Hoffman, 4200 yes, Leonard Place in Beaverdale. I'm very pleased that the Closest Creek project is now developing. Um, most of you on staff were not around to know this was not a first time. It was an exact duplicate of 1998. And so my concern is commitment to getting this done rather than finding other priorities along the way. Also, my neighbors are concerned about the, the lost tax, <laughs> LOST. Mm -hmm. uh, we want, when will we have figures on that so that we know uh, what amount of money is coming in and how can we be sure that we continue to get a substantial amount of that fund for our, uh, our uh, Closest Creek and many other projects throughout the city? We've, the committee we served, some of us served on, recommended that we have an assessment, a citywide assessment, and I understand that they are working on that right now to, do, to get that contracted. And that may develop many more things than what we're already planning on. So just uh, a, spe a little bit about the sales tax, a little bit about the commitment, and a reminder that it has happened before. Sure. And it's, uh, we just can't neglect it another time because it's citywide. Um, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, confirm for you that a, a portion of the local option sales tax is dedicated to stormwater and infrastructure. Uh, the first thing out of the gate is the stormwater citywide master plan um, that, you, that, that you mentioned. Um, and that will take a, a, a look at all 90 square miles of the city in order to, uh, to evaluate the stormwater needs in, in each of the sub watersheds of the city. Um, and, and balance those against each other. Um, I, I'm, I'm confident that the outcome of that will, will keep um, neighborhoods that you're concerned about particularly towards the front of the list there because there is an extensive history of damage in those locations. So it's, that's, uh, that, that makes the heat map really hot in those areas where, where there's existing damage. There are stormwater needs elsewhere in the city, uh, but they are, don't usually cause they don't, they, don't, they don't always cause uh, as much damage as, uh, as the storms that we've seen um, that, that do. I'm sorry? Yeah. 
understand it. You are, what you are, I think people need to understand what you are doing, what you are spending from that particular sales tax. Sure. Yeah, that's, uh, as I said, quadrupling the communications team gives us a lot more tools and capabilities to be able to address the specific in, you know, communication needs of the, the, the community, and I'm, I'm sure they're um, more than willing to better communicate what we are doing with the local option sales tax. And you're going to actually hear more about that yet tonight, so great question. Others? Hi, I'm Morgan Bennett. Um, I live over in Fairmount Park. And I don't mean to bring up potholes because that comes up at every city meeting. But I did see on the website that you guys are using a new filling for potholes during the winter because it's more easily mixed with water. And I yep. was wondering if that, I know that it costs more than traditional filling, but I was wondering if it over time it'll save the city money since they don't have to continually refill the same potholes. We are, uh, as, as you correctly identified, um, uh, we actually have two different what we'll call premium materials that we're testing out this winter um, with the expectation, uh, you know, the manufacturers claim that they'll last a lot longer. Um, um, our typical winter pothole repair material is, to, to call it suboptimal, is, is being very nice. Um, it's cold mix asphalt. It never really sets up, which is by design so that we can stockpile it at the beginning of the winter and it stays it doesn't turn into a solid rock like like uh, regular asphalt would so we can stick a shovel full in and, and fill a pothole with it that lets us make the pothole safe for a period of time we hope to get several days several weeks sometimes you can get several months out of out of it uh, but when the weather is really bad if you get a couple days we're doing pretty good so we're trying out two new materials they do cost uh, noticeably more um, they are um, uh, one of them in particular uses water as an activating agent. So a perennial problem with winter pothole patching is that there is snow melt or melted ice or snow in the bottom of the, of the pothole. And that you know, oil and water don't mix very well, whether it's asphalt or, uh, or uh, cold or hot. Um, but this product takes that weakness and turns it into an advantage. So we expect to not have to return to do those. Um, it, it is noticeably more more expensive, so we're we're trying that out with an initial with an initial purchase um, of a, of a several hundred pounds of this product. Um, and if it works great uh, and lasts as long as promised, then we'll continue investing in that um, in uh, in future months through this winter um, and uh, put it into our our toolkit for winters from now on. Okay. One more question. Has the citywide assessment for stormwater gone out for bid? Um, no, it's, it's, we'll, we'll be issuing a request for proposals from engineering firms um, here shortly. I'm not exactly sure which, which month that will go out, but I would expect that in the near-term future. Okay, because I, I think the committee had requested that it be completed by July of 2021. Does that sound right? Sounds right. I wasn't at that meeting because I was out of the state. I will be at the next one. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think that's all the time we've got for this question. So if you want to catch me afterwards or anybody from the engineering department, um, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Again, Scott Sanders, the city manager. Um, I also want to thank you for coming out tonight, um, especially in this cold evening, and to listen to us, but also to offer up questions and input as we uh, produce our future year budgets because as you heard earlier in the presentation uh, we're at that starting point where we have some of the information that we need to develop our budgets but we still have a ways to go the next six to eight weeks and we could use your input in and in how we develop this next couple of years budget we also like to uh, plan out a second year so we're only required to have one additional budget that would start in July of next year and, and cover 12 months but we like to do two years worth of budget so we understand what the impact might be in that second year as well. Um, and so thank you again for, for coming out. I also want to thank staff and, and Bob. I know he'll have a, a great retirement, um, but we will miss you greatly there, Bob. Thank you. Um, but again, we've got a strong team, and we're led by a strong council. 
and really that's that's what I'm up here to, to talk about is the city has uh, over the last four to five years in particular uh, addressed an awful lot of bold concerns and bold issues that have lasted um, and have, have been uh, occurring if you will over decades uh, older infrastructure uh, facilities for the city uh, that are aging um, our neighborhoods we've tried many attempts in revitalizing our neighborhoods and have not found that right mix yet um, and so we have a new program underway called invest DSM uh, that brought in experts from across the country to help us understand how best uh, to revitalize our neighborhoods and so that is a huge part of what this council has been willing to address uh, in a very bold way part of this uh, success from the past year has involved the, the zoning code uh, which actually was uh, uh, the predecessor of that was our land use plan so we developed our comprehensive plan um, finished that up about, uh, about three years ago now and dove right into the new zoning code so we have that now passed uh, it is a living document so there is a set of amendments that are also now coming through uh, we would always expect to continuously review our zoning codes and uh, make updates as necessary and as things change um, so it's been a great success that is a uh, over 50 year old document and policy with our zoning code so again, uh, it's not every day or even every uh, few years that something of that magnitude uh, is addressed. And so I'm very pleased that this council uh, has stuck to that planning, has involved uh, several hundred uh, citizens in those conversations over dozens and dozens of meetings the last couple years. And for that, we now have a new uh, zoning code. Um, the Invest DSM I mentioned briefly, that is our new approach on in, uh, revitalizing our neighborhoods. It's a very comprehensive uh, approach. In the past, uh, we have tried other uh, uh, recommendations where maybe the infrastructure was improved and some of the nonprofits were involved. Uh, what we found was uh, a temporary improvement uh, to the situation with the neighborhoods involved. Uh, but not a lasting uh, growth opportunity, uh, a situation where as soon as the uh, completion of those conversations were done, uh, the, the neighborhoods would maybe drift back into uh, disrepair. So we knew we had to be bold. And so the Invest DSM is a partnership with the city and the county, uh, and we will bring in private entities as well to assist with, with investment in our neighborhoods in particular, uh, assistance with uh, housing uh, needs uh, the key here is we want to have our neighborhoods to be competitive in a regional sense when new residents are moving to the area we want the Des Moines neighborhoods to be top of list of options for new families to to move into and this plan will get us there because uh, the other discussion is the local option sales tax uh, that's a very bold uh, move by our residents in voting for the new sales tax. Uh, obviously, you've heard an awful lot about the four initiatives involved with the sales tax, but rebuilding our neighborhoods uh, was top of list of that. And so um, there's a short video here, and I'll finish my comments on the sales tax. If you take a close look at a penny these days, you really don't see a whole lot. You can't buy anything with one. We're more than happy to leave them behind. And get this, it costs more than two cents just to make one penny. So what good are they? Well, believe it or not, there's a lot of value in that single penny. And it's being felt these days in Des Moines. It all began last spring when Des Moines voters supported local sales and service tax for the city of Des Moines. By adding just that single cent, voters put in motion a catalyst that will reverse years of inadequate resources and trigger a positive impact for decades on our city, its neighborhoods, and residents. Here's how. The one cent sales tax that took effect on July 1st will generate roughly $37 million for Des Moines each year. This new money, a third of which comes from visitors to Des Moines, will have transformative and measurable impacts for our city in several ways. It begins with property taxes. By state law, 50% of the new sales tax revenue must go towards property tax relief. Those efforts are already underway. 
Just two days after receiving approval from voters, the City Council reduced Des Moines' property tax levy to its lowest in the last seven years. Thanks to the new sales tax and the value of all those pennies, visitors and commuters now help fund the much needed improvements to our aging infrastructure. This includes repaving and replacing Des Moines streets as well as vital storm sewer upgrades to help keep our neighborhoods protected during heavy rains and floods. The city has also committed local option revenue to reinvest in the heart of Des Moines, our neighborhoods. We expanded operating hours at every one of the city's six public libraries. And we're able to implement a new program called Blitz on Blight that allows us to take down 10 times as many houses like this in the city of Des Moines in a year. And to better serve our growing community, local option revenue is used to enhance public safety by hiring an additional 13 firefighters and much-needed mobile mental health crisis services for young people. Providing property tax relief, fixing our streets and our storm sewers, strengthening our neighborhoods, enhancing public safety. Our commitments to this city are clearly defined thanks to the strong mandate delivered by voters last spring. As we continue to improve our city and the lives of those who call Des Moines home, we promise to use these local option funds effectively, responsibly, and transparently. Our community is worth every penny. So the question was asked about transparency with the sales tax spend. And so we have made a commitment that we will have uh, an annual report uh, on every, where every penny has been spent on the sales tax. So we talked about the uh, flood mitigation. You heard in the video that the tax rate has been lowered and will be maintained at that lower rate. And I've got a few comments uh, about where our next year's look uh, in regards to property taxes as well. The infrastructure, though, is critical to this as well. So improving on uh, the uh, streets is, is a high priority of the sales tax as well. Um, so, and then the neighborhood revitalization I mentioned. So we have the resources now we have heard from the public the high expectation that we use those resources in the basic services, public safety and infrastructure. So you will see that in the reporting that we do uh, with, with the sales tax funds uh, that have just started to be collected uh, in July. Uh, so the, uh, I, I think I've mentioned all the 2019 challenges that we have. Uh, moving forward into 2020, here's a glimpse into what we're seeing as uh, we start to prepare the budget for 2020. Uh, we, we have had strong uh, property tax valuation growth, and so there, there is not a discussion of a need for service level uh, cuts. Uh, many of you, as I look out there, I'm, I'm familiar with uh, as neighborhood advocates and whatnot uh, that are familiar with years past where Des Moines has had to make service level cuts. That is not the case as we look at this next two-year budget. In fact, what you've heard through the videos and conversation is we actually will be increasing services as we continue to grow as a community. Uh, uh, more money put into the streets and the infrastructure with stormwater included in that, as well as um, services with public safety and additional investments in even parks and recs. So the, the whole gamut, uh, if you will, we have an opportunity as the expectations have, have risen by our, our citizenry uh, to actually deliver on that with the sales tax. I'm confident we will look back uh, 10, 15 years from now and realize that the citizens vote on the sales tax was the critical turning point that will allow uh, the city of Des Moines to thrive in many ways. Um, so I'm very proud to, to be a resident of Des Moines uh, with that going on. So exactly what is the situation with the property tax rate? You heard about, uh, I'll repeat, that with the sales tax vote, just two days after that public vote, the city council acted by lowering the city's tax rate. So that's pretty impressive uh, to, to happen that quickly and that significantly. Uh, that was the second largest cut in the city's history, entire history. Um, so a, a pretty big deal. Um, but it's also a promise that, that we will be able to maintain that uh, for several years to come. Now, fast forward to the 2020 budget, and we've had strong valuation growth. Uh, so there's definitely the word out there that Des Moines uh, a, a community of choice for living as we see the property values increase. And so now uh, the conversation in this next budget cycle is, is there enough growth in the tax base 
that we can actually return uh, some of that uh, to the taxpayers with a rate decrease. Uh, the mayor has asked specifically that I, as a city manager, prepare a budget that shows a property tax rate decrease. We are far enough along in the data that we've been able to collect on this budget cycle that I will tell you tonight, I feel confident I will be able to deliver a budget to the mayor that shows no cuts in services and, in fact, continued support uh, for the infrastructure and the basics that we've talked about and has a tax rate reduction in it. Uh, the details of that still need to be worked out exactly how much and when that will occur, but uh, stay, stay in touch with us on that um, as we have more information. Um, also, we have a, a, what we're calling a good neighbor initiative. One of the services that we heard from the public, and this council is very dedicated to this, is more attention on our neighborhoods in the sense of compliance. Now, a lot of times that has meant in the past rental certificates. Um, and moving forward, we will be addressing property maintenance codes as well. In other words, we want to make sure that the exteriors of our homes um, are not dragging down neighborhoods and that we're being good neighbors to each other. But it also raises the, expect, raises the expectation that, uh, that, that we're communicating with our neighbors as well. Because you might find that the best solution for some of that uh, degrading uh, conditions could be resolved within the neighborhood if we just assist our own neighbors. Um, so it's not just about the built environment when we talk about neighborhood improvements. It's about the people within our neighborhoods, our residents. And so look, in, uh, as you hear uh, in the near future, to, <clears throat> excuse me, discussions about how the city can assist in building up our neighborhoods from the people aspects as well. Um, oftentimes we get focused on the built environment and the buildings, the infrastructure, um, but we want to make sure we, we keep focused on our uh, residents as well. So there'll be additional good neighbor initiatives that you'll hear about as well. Uh, with the policies that the council has been willing to address, the comprehensive plan, the zoning code, a strategic plan, uh, it really builds the foundation when we have resources to take on bold initiatives. Um, and, and so I would tell you in 2020 and beyond, um, we are going to continue to address the hard issues, the, uh, uh, even the infrastructure that may be uh, decades old. For instance, our bridges in downtown are a century old in most cases. And so we, we are addressing things that won't have to be readdressed sometimes for another 100 years. Uh, the zoning code, um, not that I can commit the next city manager or city council to this, but I'm pretty sure we won't go another 50 years uh, before we address the zoning code again. Because this council recognized how important it is to stay current, and part of that is the public input like tonight. So um, the mayor also mentioned that uh, th these are year-long conversations and uh, plenty of notice. Um, this year, um, we're fortunate again with the situation of the new sales tax and growth and valuation that we don't have to discuss any service rate cuts. Uh, but if that were ever to occur, it would be known well in advance uh, because we also have six-year planning on capital. We're doing two-year operational budgets. We're looking at our debt service rates and tax uh, uh, in rent, uh, excuse me, revenues way out years in advance. So uh, we've added layers of sophistication to all of our planning. We have resources. It's a great time to be living in the city of Des Moines, and we're going to continue uh, to make that type of progress in the near future. And so now I'm actually, especially with such an intimate crowd, uh, open this up uh, you know, for questions. Is that 40% of our land mass of the nonprofits don't pay any taxes? Thank you for bringing that. That is accurate, yes. So is there any way that we can get the non-contributing property owners and nonprofits to pay a share to help yeah. with the rest of the city? Sure. So I'm going to take a step up on uh, many of you know that I was the finance director before I became city manager. Two elements of every budget that you need to start with and really stay focused on are what are the total expenditures that your government is spending and where is that and are they sticking to the priorities that the citizens need. But the second element of that is 
when you are agreeable to what should be spent, how do you generate revenues from the residents, from the, from the property owners, and from other sources uh, to distribute those costs in a fair way? And what I mean by that is property taxes are about half of what our revenues are. But there are other fees, like the franchise fee, for instance, for which you pay on gas and electric bills that everyone pays, including nonprofits and governmental entities. So we're, we're always constantly looking at what's the fair distribution of those costs and who should be paying for that and how much. So that's why, again, uh, I'm so proud of the fact that our voters understood that the importance of a franchise fee for which all property owners pay was an important way to distribute that. It's a broader tax base than just the 60 percent of those of us that own property and pay property taxes. To add to that, the sales tax conversation, because over 30 percent of the sales tax that gets generated is from non-Des Moines residents. It is those visitors coming to Des Moines that help pay then for infrastructure and all the sales tax initiatives that we have. And so again, uh, a good focus on what our expenditures are always makes sense. But then in the second conversation needs to be how to fairly distribute those costs uh, through different mechanisms, uh, fines and fees. I'll tell you, if we had more time, uh, fines are part of that as well because uh, there's, there's all kinds of elements of uh, uh, making sure that we are complying with, with our laws as well. Um, one of the, the main reasons why I came here tonight was over um, property taxes. I work a lot with people that are on disability and the people that are like retired on, on social security benefits. And as their, medic, as their health decreases to cover, the, they have to spend on all their assets. And as their property values are going up, they're being priced out of their homes. And this is a, a major problem that I'm seeing with the people that I work with on a daily basis is that a lot of people who have been people lifelong living in Des Moines can no longer afford the houses they've lived in for 60 years. And I was wondering if you guys are, can address some of that stuff in your new budgets. Okay, and so this kind of was like what the question before. Um, there are certain things that we have control of and some that we don't. So we don't have the ability today to tax different age groups or even classes of property. Uh, by state law, we're only allowed to have one property tax rate that all residents, all commercial properties of all ages and types pay based on the value, the market value. Um, so, uh, you know, it's more a question of uh, are, are we getting that fairly distributed like I was talking. So, um, so there are other uh, me mechanisms in place for uh, the homestead tax. Um, I'm trying to think what else would be assistance. But, but essentially, we don't have the ability to make that distinction. Well, obviously, it would, yeah. Yeah, and so there's, there's an equity question there, too, is if there's an availability to lower rates, should it be done across the board, or should we be singling out certain groups? Um, that, that's part of the question as well. Um, but the key is, uh, how would we pay for any tax rate reduction of any, of any sort? And would there be a service level impact? Oftentimes what we hear is that they want to see additional services. Those are things we can control. Um, if, if there's, again, neighborhood revitalization, and, and you're going to hear more about that is uh, as we bring on property maintenance codes, we also, the council is committed to bringing on resources to help property owners with whatever improvements they may need to make uh, within their homes. And so it's, it's, it's bringing uh, resources to, to the issue as well. Um, the name is Carolyn Eulen Hake Walker. I live at 4111 Ingersoll Avenue. I am also a member of the Des Moines Citizens Task Force on Sustainability. Um, I, I'm looking at the 2020 opportunities, and I do hope that the city of Des Moines will look at um, the opportunity now to uh, 
look at what's happening in our environment at this time, that we really do have a climate emergency going on. Um, if you look at the Iowa project out of University of Iowa and also a research done by Iowa State University, our rainfall and extreme rainfall is going to double by the middle of the century. So I guess what I would like to say is I don't think we have time to waste. I would really like the city of Des Moines, and I know the task force has also asked for this for several years, to uh, look at adopting a climate action plan that looks, looks at all the areas to um, not only mitigate carbon, uh, you know, the carbon emissions that are happening in, in uh, around Des Moines, but also uh, how to adapt to the serious situations that can and will happen as the climate changes. So I, uh, I just looked at that and that this is an opportunity to look at this as preventative, proactive, and um, you know, I've heard things like we need, you know, 140 some million for stormwater and 30 some million for the new railroad um, freight places. I'm talking about a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars to go forth with a climate action plan and a, and a full time sustainability coordinator that could coordinate all those activities with the city departments. Okay. So a lot of that activity is happening in pieces. And I said a lot of that activity is ha happening in pieces. But what I hear you say is let's make sure we have a, a comprehensive plan to address the climate so that we can prioritize where those resources are going. That's great input. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, Dan Werfel, I live at 2336 Farwell in Fairmont Park. Um, just to double down on Carolyn's stuff there, you heard formal counsel, former Councilman Coleman say that the climate won in 2018, and the climate doesn't lose. So I just want to you know, point that out and keep Carolyn's comments in mind. But back to the previous conversation about the gentleman up front who works with folks that are on Social Security income and um, with the city's initiatives to you know, especially update the zoning code and the requirements of the zoning code and talking about increasing property value, which of course the city can't control, but all of the steps that you're taking are to make Des Moines a better place, which also increases the property value. So how do you bring people along with you in that process to make sure that people aren't priced out of their homes? What's the city doing with Invest DSM, with the Good Neighbor Initiative to make sure that equity is addressed and that people can stay in their homes? Right, and, and so there's a lot that's going on. Um, one of the things we recognize as we started the conversation with neighborhood revitalization is that it's not just about getting more families into their homes, but giving them an opportunity to build wealth within their homes, right? Because it's not a matter of, well, we've done a great job putting a, few, a couple thousand more families into affordable housing if five years later the very housing we put them in is now worth less. We may have actually just done them a disservice if we haven't addressed the neighborhood issues for which we are helping uh, families move into. Um, so th there is a balance conversation that we need to be realistic about. The city needs 3.5% on, on average growth in revenue to cover our costs just to keep service levels about the same. And so if we've got a couple options, right? We'd like to see the valuations go up 3.5% or more and leave the tax rate the same, or if the growth is 5 6%, actually bring the rate down. The alternative is if we're not investing uh, in our neighborhoods and solving some of these issues, the values are going down, but we still need that 3.5% growth. Our options at that point are to raise the tax rate. And that's not a better option because what you're doing is raising tax rates on a decreasing asset at that point. So it's a lose-lose proposition. What you find is we are actually in a much better situation with high value growth that then the citizens and our, res our residents are, are keeping us honest with looking at the tax rate and providing the services for those most in need in an equitable way. Does that make sense? Because it's not as simple as that you, you don't want your values to go down. And in fact, if your values are only going up 1% or 2% a year, it puts your service levels at risk. And so we, we have to make sure that we're understanding there is a sweet spot 
of sustainable growth that gains in both parties. The homeowners are seeing appreciation, value going up in, in their property, and your service levels are able to be maintained. Does that make sense? but the access to housing isn't there. And so, you know, you, you can hit that sweet spot, but if you're not providing an opportunity for people to have access to affordable housing still, if the services aren't compensating enough, then you're still losing out in the equity department. Yeah, what I hear you saying is, we can't take our eyes off the ball that we still have to provide new inventory for workforce housing, ability for families entering the metro area to still have that affordable option. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, that, that seems right. And not allow any of our residents to be priced out of the entire market. So they, they should still have options. And in fact, what you're gonna hear more in 2020 is workforce housing is one of the uh, initiatives that we're gonna try and resolve on a regional basis. And, and that is about uh, still allowing workforce housing to have options uh, for both rent and uh, ownership in multiple areas, not concentrated in just single neighborhoods, but region-wide spread. Because again, our, our residents are utilizing services and whether it be entertainment, uh, school, medical, education, all of that in a regional sense. So we also should be providing housing in a regional sense at all price points. This, this is my last question that I'm giving the mic up. <laughs> um, but I know that in the zoning process, you addressed that our neighbors regionally, so neighbor, neighboring municipalities need to participate as well. And in what ways is the city of Des Moines working with the neighboring municipalities to, to help address that regionally, so to speak? Sure. And it, it starts with, uh, I'll, I'll put a shout out to our code enforcement, or our, uh, yeah, code codes um, and our uh, fire department because we have been talking with the entire metro area about having the same building codes, having the same fire codes, uh, and working together to bring those up. More recently, the conversation has also expanded to stormwater. And, and so um, afterwards, I think Jonathan could answer questions for you about how we're um, equalized, standardizing, normalizing, uh, the same standards in stormwater as we have with, with building codes and fire codes. It is so crucial that, that we have uh, more of a unified answer to uh, the standards of development uh, that we have region-wide. I think the mayor might have had another. And then I'm going to let the mayor actually, if he would, wrap us up at, after that as well. Mm -hmm. taking the I just wanted to, uh, not only what you said, but what Carolyn uh, talked to, and I know that... Uh, Josh and I have talked about it a lot. And one of the things is we think about our invest DM strategy and looking at all the neighborhoods in the city of Des Moines and all the residences. Not long ago, we did sort of a study. What are the ages of the homes in the city of Des Moines? And that's part of what the strategy is. How do we lift up values, get people to invest in neighborhoods, uh, you know, really uh, get neighborhoods on the rebound and uh, people are proud of where they live and and all the neighbors work together But one of the things that I think is is missing for me and uh, hopefully our sustainability coordinator can help Look at investments. How do we not only make the neighborhoods look better and feel better? But how do you make those homes perform better? So how do we you know there used to be sort of an incentive you know if you put a new furnace in that went from uh, if if we've got 60 to 70 percent of our homes that are over 60 years old my guess would be there's not a lot of insulation in there there's not a lot of uh, uh, great uh, high e value in the doors and the windows and in in all that kind of stuff and uh, um, the as i mentioned the furnaces are operating probably at 40 45 50 percent maybe efficiency when a new one would operate uh, uh, you know at 95 or better uh, depending on how it would would look. So how do we incent people to not only have their homes look better, but perform better? And so as they're making the investments, it lowers their cost of living in the in that home. Not only uh, 
you know, as we look at, at the incentive for the city, but their cost of, of living all in, hopefully, is, is on, a, on a trend that, that makes some sense. So we're not just putting paint on the place to make it look better, but let's look at, uh, you know, and, and strategize how we get all the homes in the city of Des Moines uh, on, a, on, a, on a better track for performance that will help the environment reduce the consumption of, of energy and hopefully more and more of it's going to go to renewable and uh, we can you know put all those strategies together that will benefit all the citizens of the city of des moines so um yeah well uh, yeah and quite frankly as we talked about I'd, i wish we could benchmark everything uh, let's benchmark homes let's benchmark everything so people can see uh, uh and and can help strategize how they use uh, uh, materials and whether it's water or whether it's electricity or, or whatever it is that they uh, consume and lower that consumption number. And uh, sometimes uh, even the uh, capture of, of rainwater and being able to water your lawn and your gardens and everything else is a great idea. And uh, Jonathan pointed out that we will assist uh, 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 citizens in the investment in some of those things. But I think that we ought to push it uh, even forward and try to find more ways to help them make their, their homes more energy efficient as well. So that's a separate strategy, but uh, hopefully our new uh, uh, sustainability coordinator can help push that forward and uh, work with, with neighbors and residents and businesses. And uh, let's, let's get everybody to look at how their, their buildings and their businesses and their homes are functioning and operating, and let's get everybody to... to uh, contribute to the lowering of uh, energy consumption. But uh, uh, I want to thank everybody again for coming this evening. This is a valuable exchange. And you know, I, I've learned over the last uh, couple, three months that there are some people that have felt left out of these discussions. And we need to invite all of our citizens to be part of it because uh, again, we as a city council, we as a city staff, we serve everybody. And we want everybody to, f I want to hear, sometimes the uh, conversations are painful. And, uh, uh, you know, they're not always uh, uplifting. They're criticizing. But you know what? If, if people are, uh, have some concerns, have some dreams, have some desires, let's share them. And let's all try to figure out how we make this city a better place to live and to raise a family. And uh, hopefully that our kids and grandkids are going to want to stay here and, uh, and live with us as well. So let's all keep working together. And I know that our staff is going to be uh, here for a little while. If any of you have any specific questions or want to go over some details, then I'll ask them to take good notes. And uh, for those that want to get contact back, make sure you get their contact information of any of our citizens that have some specifics. But again, thank you all for being here. Uh, and we can't wait for the next opportunity. And uh, hopefully we'll even get a larger crowd uh, as uh, people see that uh, we're here to serve you and uh, uh, thank you for participating. Appreciate it.